Okay, welcome again, everyone, to Delhi Stage. We are starting with our first talk after the keynote by James Favell. That was amazing. And uh, so we have Ben with us. Let me quickly add Ben to the stream. Yeah, we have Ben with us and Ben. Hello, everyone. Hey, Ben, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Great, great. Your microphone Excellent. is working perfectly. And can uh, I just say, I love your screen handle. <laughs> <laughs> Real Slim Shanky, all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm available on internet by this name, and if I just put my real name, no one will find out because there's a lot of people with the same name, so it's easier to Fair use enough. your internet handle. <laughs> yeah. That's so before true. we move on, I just want to thank you to Auto because Auto is one of the gold sponsors for PyCon India 2020 this year. Thanks for making it possible. And Ben is joining us from Auto, and he'll be taking us through his talk um, here on. So here's your screen, Ben. The stage is all yours. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, I, a lot of people call it ortho. It's, it's auth zero. Um, I don't know that it makes much of a difference, but just in case you're um, searching for it, uh, it's a zero at the end, not the letter O. So authzero.com if you wanted to find out more. Um, anyway, I'm here to talk to you about two identity and beyond. Stick your hands up in the chat if you love Toy Story and your favorite character is, uh, is your spaceman. Um, Buzz Lightyear. I knew I'd, I'd, it was on the tip of my tongue. There we go. All right. So I want to talk to you about identity, uh, where it came from, how, how we solve the problem, what protocols there are for it. Um, if you saw my talk yesterday, we went more in depth into the access control stuff. This is going to be more of an overview into OAuth and OpenID Connect. So let's get started. Where did it all start? Why do we have the solutions now that we, uh, that, that we, we have in order to solve the problems that we had? Now, one thing I do want to say before I go on is please ask questions throughout. I want this to be an interactive conversation. Um, if you have questions at any point about what I'm talking about or you want to go off on a tangent, we have time to do that. I'm happy to take questions at any point. If you want to leave them till the end, that's fine too. I can revisit any of the slides and we can go over it. So where did identity start? This isn't really the very start of identity. This is one of the things that um, that caused us to consider how to do identity on the internet. And it all started with this form right here. Does anybody remember on Facebook? And LinkedIn did it as well, and Google did it. I'm not blaming or attacking any one technology company. But back in the early 2000s, you would see this kind of thing very often. And the thing is, with social networks, the strength of the social network was from the network. And if you're starting your own social network from scratch, and you don't have anybody in your database, there's not much of a network there. So it, it's understandable why they implemented mechanisms like that. You join a new site, you join Facebook, for example, and they want all of your friends to join Facebook so that you'll all use Facebook together. So what they did was they gave you this form and they said, hey, give us your email address and then give us the password for your email account. And what we'll do is we'll log in to your email account and grab all of the, the emails. Does anybody think this might be an issue? I think there's probably a small security issue here. Nowadays, we're probably a lot more aware of this. We as developers are certainly more aware of it. But even mainstream, if I asked my mum to paste her email password into Facebook nowadays, she would say, I'm, I'm not doing that. We, we know that passwords shouldn't be shared even between systems that we think we trust. But this is, this is the root of it. We wanted to try and solve this problem. It's still a valid um, problem that we want to solve. We want Facebook to be able to get in touch with all our friends and say, hey, join Facebook. I mean, personally, I don't. I don't have a Facebook account. But conceptually, if you're, if you're developing an application, you want this kind of functionality to make it easier to onboard your users. So what was going on behind the scenes? I've kind of described it already. But essentially, what would happen is you would send your login credentials for your email account to Facebook. Facebook would then take those log login credentials for your email account and send them to, say, you're with Gmail. They would send them to Google server and say, hey, I want to log in with this username and this password. And Google sees that, or the email server sees that, as the user logging in. They don't necessarily know it's Facebook or another system. It, for all intents and purposes, it's a valid login by a user. It's a standard user login, which means once they're logged in, they can do everything you would do, you could do, if you logged in. So what they'll do is they'll go through your, um, your contact list and maybe even go through your emails and see all the email addresses that have been sent from and to, perhaps. I mean, they've got the possibility of doing that. They could, um, they could mine all the information in your email account and suck all of that in, all of the contacts that you have, 
And then what they would do is uh, send an email to all of those people saying, hey, Ben's just joined Facebook. Why don't you join Facebook too? Here's a link for you. Now, the really cheeky thing is that originally what Facebook did, and perhaps some of the others as well, in order to reduce spam, because if the email came from a third party, then it might go into the spam box. They wanted it to come from the person who had just joined Facebook. So they would actually use your email server to send the email. So it actually looked like it came from you. It, it wasn't even detectable that it wasn't from you because they were logged in as you. So there's a massive issue here. And then what they would do is they take those contacts and they'd put them all into a database, regardless of whether or not the person logged in. And this is more of a an ethics question as opposed to a technical security question. But they would saw all the users, even if they never followed the account. And then sometime in the future, maybe, if one of my friends joined Facebook totally independently with the same email address, they'd link it up. And then suddenly, they'd know that for all these years, we've been friends. So they would be able to suggest a lot of my posts. And it's a great way of, of um, profiling somebody before they've even joined the site. So ethics aside, let's keep, keep on the security side of things. This is obviously a huge big no-no. We don't want to share our credentials for one site with another site. So this is the problem that was solved with OAuth and OpenID Connect. So what is OAuth? OAuth, or specifically OAuth 2.0, because there's an OAuth 1 as well. Uh, OAuth can fix the, the friend finder mechanism by having you never divulge your credentials to Facebook. And let's stick with the idea that it's Facebook and Google Mail and, and you logging in. So you've got your credentials on the left-hand side here. These are your login credentials to your, your Google Mail, your Gmail account. So you make a request to, uh, to Facebook to say, hey, I want to use the friend finder mechanism. And Facebook says, that's great. I'm going to need some kind of token to be able to talk to Google. So it's going to send a response back to you, which redirects you to the Gmail server. Um, or in, in Google's case, they've got a, a one area, like uh, the accounts.google.com uh, where you log in. But you know, you're logging into Google's infrastructure at this point. So you're sending your credentials to Google, not to Facebook. And this is fine, because they're your credentials for logging into Google. So there's no reason you shouldn't. This is a perfectly normal uh, process. You're identifying yourself to Google using your Google credentials. So that's great. Google then uh, is able to generate a token uh, in, in some way. There are a number of different ways how this token can get back to Facebook. Um, I won't go into that in depth right now. But essentially, it generates a token, an access token, um, which it uses your browser as a redirect. So it'll send that back to your browser as a redirect to then send the token back to Facebook. So Facebook, when you requested the uh, access to the friend finder system, said, hey, I need a token, redirected you to the, the provider. The provider then sent back a token. That's all that Facebook has at the moment. It doesn't have any of your, your, your friends or any of those details, just a token. This token in this particular case is an access token. And what this allows the Facebook server to do is to send that access token directly to Google now to say, hey, I want to call an endpoint of yours, uh, an API, that's going to give me a list of all of the contacts in Ben's address book. It doesn't actually say Ben's address book. I want all the contacts in the address book that's associated with a user that's associated with this token that I have. So it passes this token in. And Google then looks at the token and says, well, I know this token was generated for Ben's identity, Ben logged in. This is the token we generated for that. So you now have access via this token to Ben's data. But even better than that is the token can specify the scope, the capabilities of what Facebook can do. So in the original instance before, we had uh, Facebook logging in, and it was able to search emails and look at your contacts. It's even able to send emails. This token can be locked down to only allow read access to the contact list, for example. And in this case, this is what would happen. You would have the capabilities to read contacts, and that's it. You couldn't create them. You couldn't delete them. You couldn't access emails. You couldn't send emails. All you can do is get a list of the contacts. So that the token will specify this inside. So in response to this, Google is now going to say, hey, I've validated that you have access to this. So I'm going to send you all the data you've requested. You can do whatever you like with it. So Facebook now still needs to send an email to each of these users, to each of these email addresses to say, hey, we need to join. But they can't do it through Google anymore because the token doesn't allow them to do that. So they need to find their own way of sending emails, which, to be honest, is the way they should have done it in the beginning. Uh, and now they have to. So that's great. And if we have a look at the ethics again, they're still going to put all the data in their database. They're still going to link you up years later if you join um, two, three years after your friend joined. But you know that, that's, that's what they do. That's fine. That, that's a use case. All right. So that's OAuth. OAuth is around authorization. It authorized Facebook to talk to Google. It's not authentication, though. 
So authorization is things like LinkedIn can read emails on Gmail. So you could actually have a token that allows you to read the emails. You could have one where TweetDeck can post tweets on Twitter. And this is a, a real example. I'm, I'm sure LinkedIn probably don't want to read your emails. They might want access to your contact list. Uh, but TweetDeck is a product that's now owned by Twitter, but it's still a whole separate website. And when you log into TweetDeck, you're actually logging in uh, with Twitter, which gives TweetDeck an access token to talk to Twitter's API, which means that it can post tweets, it can delete tweets, it can schedule tweets, it can do all of these things. Uh, and, and that's an authorization that's allowed between these two entities. There's an action in the middle and two entities on the outside. Eventbrite can create events on Facebook. Uh, for any of you that run uh, meetups or any kind of events, you'll know that that's actually a feature that you can do. And you can link your Facebook account to Eventbrite. From the Eventbrite portal, you'll click on um, Connect to Facebook, and you have an OAuth process that will generate a token, or Facebook will generate a token that gets sent back and gets stored by Eventbrite, so that Eventbrite can then talk to your Facebook pages, for example, and create an event based on the event that you've just defined in, in Eventbrite. And then people can even register directly on Facebook, and that gets put directly into your Eventbrite uh, database, your, your um, tickets that are generated, that kind of thing. So there's a good close coupling there. That's all done using OAuth. What OAuth can't do is something like Eventbrite can get Ben's identity from Twinter. Twinter? Twitter. That's, that's not something that OAuth supports. Again, it's an action between two entities, but the action of get Ben's identity is a very obscure one. You can, you can define what send a tweet is. You can define what uh, create an event is. But how do you define what get Ben's identity is? And uh, a lot of the social media providers, social media login providers, started adding their own mechanisms on top of, uh, of OAuth to allow this to happen. Because using, up until this point, it's been authorized Google to do something or other. The whole login with Google button at this point wasn't possible. I mean, they started started doing it, but it, it wasn't part of the, the OAuth spec. So what they did, um, Google did it, Facebook did it, a whole lot of other social media, social login providers did it, is they defined this concept of user info. User info is essentially just another API endpoint that allows you to request information about the current user, the current user being the person who has the access token that, um, or for whom the access token was generated. So if I log in, uh, to Google, and I send my access token to Facebook. Facebook can call the user info point uh, endpoint on Google server and uh, and get information about me because the access token has access to that endpoint. So in the same way as we use the token for getting contacts, uh, the contact would then be returned in some kind of format. Um, most likely, it's going to be like an iCard format or a, uh, an XML format that's fairly standardized all about your contacts. and uh, there's, there, there are libraries out there already for reading and deconstructing this information and, and incorporating it into your application. For the user info endpoint, though, the because there was no standard around it, we didn't know what the format was that was coming back. Was it going to be XML? Was it uh, just plain text? Could it have been in the same way as a post request is just multi-line key value pairs? Um, could it be JSON? And what's the endpoint? Is it slash user info or is it slash something else? There was no standardization around this. We still use the the uh, access token as the bearer token in the header in order to authorize the request to the endpoint. But each implementation was different, which meant that if you wanted to add login with Google and then login with um, LinkedIn, then you'd have to rewrite those two components because the data that comes back would be slightly different. So from this, OpenID Connect was born. And OpenID Connect is nothing more than basically the standardization of the user info endpoint, which sits on top of OAuth 2.0. So OpenID Connect cannot exist without OAuth 2.0. OAuth 2.0 is the authorization process that allows OpenID Connect to work. I tried to find a, a definition of OpenID Connect, and they're long-winded, but essentially it boils down to these points. It has to be a simple identity layer. All it does is it provides information about the identity of the person for whom the access token that you have has been generated. It needs to sit on top of OAuth 2.0, so we don't need to re-implement our own authorization. We've, we've got these protocols already that exist. So it sits on top of that, and all it does is verify identity. It doesn't allow me to get somebody else's identity. It just says, look, we know that somebody's logged in. We have this identity, and here's the information we have, the identity information we have about the person that's just logged in. It's basic profile information. It's not going to be too complicated. It's going to be things like the email address, um, maybe some permissions if you want to add those in. And that's where the, the access control talk that I did yesterday goes into. 
Uh, there'll be a, a standard identifier so that you, obviously when somebody logs in using login with a social media provider, you, you don't have a username and password in your database anymore, but you still need to know who's logged in and you need to record that against your user table. So there's a standard format for that, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. It needs to, uh, it needs to operate uh, in a REST-like manner. So there are many different ways we could have done it. It could have been SOAP. Uh, it, it has to be REST. So that's just the decision that was made, and uh, OpenID Connect has to use REST for this communication. And finally, it uses JSON as a data format. And one of the main reasons, uh, as I understand it, that JSON was chosen is because it is a standard format that almost every language has a reader for, and it allows you to put in arbitrary data. So there are some bits of data that are standardized key value pairs, and we'll look at those in a second, but you can also put your own data in. So the payload itself can contain whatever you need. So let's have a look at how OpenID Connect works. We've seen how the OAuth part works. What does OpenID Connect, that layer on top, do to change the communication process? So you've got a user, um, you've got your application in the top right-hand side that you're writing. You've got your identity provider uh, down at the bottom. Where's my mask on? Down at the bottom here. That would be like Auth0, for example. And then you've got a login page. You need to log in somehow at some point because you're doing a login process. Now, we've defined up here within this application two bits of information. We've got at the top here the client ID, and here we have a client secret. So when you define any kind of open ID connect-based authentication with an identity provider, you have to configure the identity provider to know about your application. It needs to have configuration information about where the, the users are going to be stored, uh, about whether there's a maximum number of password retries, uh, how does the password reset work, do you have multi-factor, all of these things are configuration items within the identity provider. So you have this client ID that links this instance of, uh, of the application that you've written with a, a configuration set within the identity provider. This will hopefully come up, become a bit clearer as we go through the process. We've also, that's the client ID. We've also got a client secret, and this is used for any communication between your application and the identity provider directly. It has to be kept secret. We can't publish it anywhere. The client ID can be public. That gets shared. That's fine. So user comes along and says, hey, I want to access some kind of resource. And your application says, well, you don't have access yet because we don't know who you are. You're not logged in. So I'm going to send you my client ID. And it'll also send through the scopes. So I mentioned before that scopes allow you to define uh, what actions can be taken. Uh, in this case, the scopes that get sent through by default for an OpenID Connect login mechanism are called OpenID and Profile. This basically tells the identity provider that we want an OpenID process. So we're going to get an ID token as well. And we want profile information about the user, because that's what we're going to use to manifest the user within our own databases. So the client ID and the scopes get sent over. This is actually a redirect again, much like the OAuth process, which redirects the user to Auth0, or the identity provider that you're using. At this point, you're not logged in yet, though. So you need to log into Auth0. You're not logging into Auth0 here. You're logging into your tenant or your configuration. So this is your users for your application or whichever other identity provider you're using. So the identity provider is going to return a login form to the user. And the user will then complete the credentials in there and submit them back to the identity provider. So in this case, the username and password aren't going to your application anymore. They're only going to the identity provider. Once the correct credentials have been passed in, the identity provider knows that uh, you are who you say you are. So it can then generate a, a, um, an authorization code, an auth code. And they'll send this auth code as a response back to your browser. So this auth code goes to your browser as a redirect, a 302 redirect, uh, to the uh, application, to your application. So your application has now received this auth code, which comes through as part of the query string. And you can then take that auth code. Now, at this point, this auth code has no identifiable information in it at all. It's basically a random string that is associated with my login or whoever's just logged in over in the identity provider here. So having just logged in, it's created essentially a session uh, with me to the domain that the identity provider is sitting on. And it says, OK, I'm going to generate this auth code. I'm going to remember that this, this auth code was generated for Ben because he just logged in. So your application now has the auth code, and it's able to take the auth code and now the client secret. And it'll send those to Auth0, whichever identity provider you're using. It'll send those because it's all standardized um, protocols. It'll take those two bits of information. And it'll say, hey, I've got this auth code. Here's my client secret in order to prove that I am who I say I am. 
I'd like to exchange this auth code for some tokens. So the identity provider will then take that auth code and say, okay, well, I know this auth code was generated for Ben. So I'm going to generate some tokens for Ben. And it's going to generate uh, an ID token and an access token, and perhaps also a refresh token. And it'll then send those tokens back. Now, because this request was made by post, uh, a post request, the data that gets returned is wrapped up inside the payload of the post response, which means it's never going to appear in any query strings. It won't appear in any logs. It's a, a, a pretty secure way of passing those tokens back to your application. And your application now has uh, an access token and an ID token, which will allow it to know who's logged in and potentially with that access token, start accessing other bits of information as well. Now, I mentioned the user info endpoint. There is still a user info endpoint at the identity provider which will give you the information that's inside the identity token. But by default, nowadays, the identity token is returned as well as part of this I want some tokens request, because it's inevitable you're going to want it, so we might as well send it the first time. But you could also call that endpoint to get information further down the track. So how do these tokens look like? They, they're called JSON Web Tokens, or JWTs. Some people will call them JOTs. I think the, the official specification says the pronunciation of JWT is JOT. I personally have a huge objection to this because I think it's ridiculous. If you disagree with me, let me know. We can have an argument about that. It sounds like fun. No, it's only a pronunciation. But yeah, JSON web tokens are basically tokens for the web that contain JSON. Um, if you haven't seen what a JSON web token looks like on the inside, let's go and have a look. That's what a JSON web token looks like. Make sense? OK, we'll move along. In a normal conference scenario, I'd see your faces and hopefully you'd be laughing at this point. It's always hard when you're doing it from home. So I'm going to assume you laughed at my joke, and I'll go straight on to the, OK, well, let's have a look a little bit more in depth at what a JSON Web Token looks like. I'll color code it, and I'll just highlight these two punctuation marks, the full stops. So there are three components to a JSON Web Token. The red part at the top is the header. The purplish, light purple part in the middle is the payload. And then we have the yellow part at the end, which is actually more green. Don't know what it looks like to you. Uh, <laughs> that's the signature. And they're separated by full stops. The first and second parts are base64 URL encoded. And in fact, the third part is as well. But the first and second parts are base64 URL encoded JSON. So we could essentially just take this, run it through a base64 URL decoder, and get the JSON straight out. There's no encryption. There's no protection. If somebody gets access to any token, they can read it. I mean, humans would probably need to use a decoder. I can't read this. That's why I have this screen here, which tells you what's actually inside it. So the header. Uh, has typically at least two key value pairs. Uh, the first one that's in there is usually the type. I mean, not necessarily in that order. Um, but uh, the type is JSON Web Token in this case. Now, the idea here, obviously, it's JSON Web Token. We wouldn't know that if we didn't know it was a JSON Web Token, because otherwise we, uh, we would not have decoded it as a JSON Web Token. So instead, what we we could do in the future is we can have JSON Web Token types, and we can add like the plus addressing in the same way as you have um, uh, content types that have pluses in them to break down the kind of JSON Web Token it is. So it's built for future um, flexibility. The algorithm is important, though. So this is telling us that we're using an HMAC SHA-256 hashing algorithm uh, in order to create the signature. Uh, I won't go into depth into what the different algorithms are. HMAC SHA-256 is a pre-shared key basis, so every application is going to have to know the key for generating the, the signature. There's also RS or uh, RSA SHA-256, which is a public-private key mechanism, which is arguably stronger and safer because then you can just share a public key with anybody and they can verify the signature is valid. And then the payload itself has the subject. I mentioned before that there's this one key that you can use to know who's logged in. Every time I log in in the future, the subject will always be the same. If I change my email address, if I change my password, if I change my username, uh, any of these things, my subject will always be the same. This is the unique ID. When you consume an identity token into your application, you can rely on that subject as an identity uh, link in your user database. So if you've got your own database of users, you store the subject in there, not a username and password. And then the signature part, if you look down at the bottom here, we've got this assertion. So basically, we take the header that we had and the subject. We concatenate them. We base64 URL encode the result of the hashing algorithm, in this case, the HMAC SHA-256. So if we take this, and we, sh we SHA it, and then we base64 URL encode it with that pre-shared key that all the applications would need, then that is going to reproduce a signature. 
And if the signature matches the signature here, which is the signature that came in the original token, then we can trust that the header and the payload haven't changed. It's how most signatures work, but that's how it works for a JSON web token. Now, other kinds of JSON web tokens I've mentioned are access tokens, and access tokens give you different bits of information. This is not about the user's identity. This is about what the bearer of the token can do on behalf of that user. So if I log in to your application, your application gets an access token. You can use this token against APIs in the ecosystem uh, that, that are defined as essentially audiences. And you can see in here, there's an audience uh, on that third line there. Uh, an audience is an API or an endpoint for whom an access token is intended to be consumed. So you wouldn't consume an access token that's not designed for your system. You've got an issuer, so you know who created it. You've got the subject again. So even without the identity token, you can make a request to an API and the API knows who has made the request or who the user is that the token was generated for that's making the request. You have an IAT is the issued at, EXP is the expiry, so you have uh, timestamps. And then we've got those scopes that I've mentioned. So sometimes they, uh, they, if you're looking at third-party connections to third-party APIs, you'll be using scopes more. Otherwise, you might use a permissions array. But again, this is JSON. So you can put whatever you want in there and then consume that at the endpoint. All right, so the title promised beyond. And the next screen is a little more um, conceptual. So let's just jump straight into it. We have. Uh, an example here where you might have, you've got your user on the left here, and I hope you can see my, my mouse moving on your screens. Um, sometimes it's a little too small and vague. But the, the, the user object at the top left here uh, is basically the, the person who's trying to log in. Uh, on the right in the middle, we've got Auth0 or the identity server. And all around, we've got all of this communication going through. And this is just um, requests between systems. So you might have your web application here talking to a database. You can have an API also talking to a database. You can have a mobile phone app that talks to the database via an API connection. And you've got your, your desktop app, the, the web app that could be talking to the API via AJAX while also getting information from. So you're familiar with complex situations like this. But when it comes to authorization and making sure that when the, uh, the web application is talking to the API, that it's doing it on behalf of the correct user, without having to, to share um, credentials or imply any kind of implicit trust. Uh, because if, you, if the web application talks to the API without using the user's credentials, the API would have to just trust that any request from the web application is safe. Not necessarily a great idea. We can use access tokens at this point as well. So the access token can be generated by your identity provider. And you'll notice that the orange lines here from the mobile phone and from the, uh, the web app here, these are the login flows. And these send the credentials, and they only ever get sent to the identity provider. So the credentials are never shared with any other application. The identity provider can uh, exchange with an Active Directory service, for example, in order to make sure that the person who's logging in is using credentials from Active Directory, so you can do a single sign-on, perhaps. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities of how you can uh, design your ecosystem of applications, services, service-oriented architecture or monolithic, however you decide, um, but without having to to focus on the credential storage and management and the transmission of those credentials between systems. JSON web tokens uh, by themselves, even outside of the scope of an, of an identity provider, can, can alleviate a lot of those issues. And then within the scope of an identity provider as well, uh, because identity, uh, OpenID Connect identity providers will use JSON web tokens as part of the spec, uh, it, it's an easy way to integrate all of these disparate systems and have uh, a consistent underlying mechanism for conveying who the user is in all of these requests that are going on. So it's a bit of a massive bird's eye overview, this one here. Uh, but I wanted to point out that it's not just about logging in. At the very least, if you're starting off with your, your uh, a new application, and it's a pet project, or it's a new application at work, a, a new project you're working on, um, stick an OAuth OpenID Connect authentication mechanism in at the beginning. Because when you scale and you get to this point, you don't want to be thinking in the future about how to how to deal with this communication mechanism uh, in a secure way. If you're using tokens already from the beginning, it makes your scale journey a lot easier. Uh, that's all I have to talk about uh, during this session. I'm happy to take questions, as I mentioned. Uh, so thank you for your time. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm on most of the social medias uh, at Ben Dekrai, and uh, my Twitter DMs are open. If you have any feedback on this talk, we're giving away t-shirts to anybody who provides feedback. 
Um, so if you go to, well, not anybody who provides feedback, but if you um, if you go to a0.2 slash feedback dash Ben, uh, there's a form there that you can fill out to make sure you select my name so that we know that it's about me. And it's just good to know the kind of people that are in your audience, what's working, if there's any way we can explain things better. Um, and you'll go into a draw. We'll do a monthly draw for a T-shirt. Uh, and if you want to learn more from me, I'm t I talk about security and uh, related tech web development uh, platforms and, and, and products. Uh, I'm on YouTube as well. So I'd love you to follow me over there and, uh, and stay in touch. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben. Thanks a lot. We have a lot of engagement on uh, chat, on Hopping Chat. Lovely. <laughs> so I filtered out uh, two questions from that. So right. you shared two different um, diagrams. One is before the beyond slides, and one is after the beyond slide. So when mm -hmm. you were taking the diagram, explaining the diagram before the uh, diagram slide, uh, which was fairly very simple, only the authentication part between the third party sure. and the or zero. So the question so, came during that. Uh, this is the authentication one. So yeah, this so one this, here. Yeah, this one. This one. So the yeah. question goes from the diagram. I can see there are many requests getting redirected. Will it will not that cause slowness in my application? Uh, not really. So remember, this is only the login component. The redirect, there's only two redirects. The first one is when you make a request. Uh, imagine your application is going to send a 401 unauthorized. Instead of a 401 unauthorized, it's going to send a 302 redirect to the login. So that's the first part is logging in. And then the second redirect is getting the access, uh, the authorization code back to your application. So there are two redirects that happen in the OpenID Connect login process. Once your application has the token, this, this no longer happens. Everything just goes on as normal. You've now got a token and an ID token, an access token and an ID token. So you know who I am. I'm logged in. So during the login process only, you'll get two redirects. And it's not going to add that much overhead. Got it. And we have the next question. Are JWT similar to CSRF tokens? Uh, they have very different purposes. So JWT itself, it's a token. It doesn't necessarily have to be for identity or access tokens. JWTs by themselves are a, a standard that allows you to encapsulate a payload and transport it or send it to somebody in a way that they can then verify. And by they, I mean like a system, not a human. Uh, verify with the signature that the payload hasn't been modified. So it's basically a way of sending. And the, the technical term in JSON Web Tokens is the stuff inside the payload is a set of claims. I'm claiming that my name is Ben. I'm claiming that the issue, the token was issued at this time. And the signature verifies that these claims are correct. So JSON Web Token is basically a way of sending claims in a way that you can verify they haven't been modified in transit. A CSRF token is a, a random string that's, that's part of a form submission uh, that gets checked against a, uh, a session in order to make sure that a form is submitted from the the same browser that it was rendered to, so that you can't get um, cross-site requests coming through incorrectly, essentially. So while CS CSRF tokens are an important part of the login page in order to verify that there's no attacks in terms of attacking these forms, uh, it, the JSON web token itself is just a way of transporting verified data around. I hope that ex explains the difference between the two. So we have one last question. What is sure. your view regarding Keycloak? Uh, I used Keycloak once about five years ago, I think. So any changes to Keycloak since then, um, I can't speak about. But I, I come from a PHP background originally. So Keycloak wasn't necessarily natively comfortable for me. I found the configuration was quite complicated. Uh, and But the thing is that I, I also know people who, who have worked on the project, who use the project. And once it's up and running, it's quite stable, as I understand it. I've never really gotten to the point where I got it working. But that might just be me. Uh, the thing with Keycloak, though, is that it is an application that you are hosting yourself. So if that's something you want to take on, that's fine. One of the things, one of the reasons why um, I always recommend people use something like Auth0 or Stripe for payments uh, or, or any of these as a service providers is the application that you're writing, unless you want to be an identity provider, your key benefit is in writing software that makes uh, your application better for your users. Writing better identity is not going to make it better for your users. And even hosting your own identity is not going to make it better for your users. If you can outsource that uh, and not have to worry about it, you can save in terms of maintenance. One example, um, 
Atlassian came over to Auth0 a couple of years ago, and all of the Atlassian logins are now through us. I hear different numbers depending on which person within the organization I talk to. But let's let's pick one of the numbers that I heard once. There were 13 people working in the identity team at Atlassian. Those 13 staff were able to work on new features and fixing bugs and various other business as usual aspects of the product. So suddenly, Atlassian was able to concentrate more on making its products better rather than focusing all their time or 13 people's time on identity because they were able to outsource that. So there's always a pro and con to, to hosting your own. Um, thanks thanks yeah. for a uh, bit out of time. And uh, sure. <laughs> we have great comments on the on the chat, and people are appreciating your talk. And uh, and I guess all the questions uh, that uh, you have taken, uh, the people who asked the questions has, have replied that they've got to your answer, and they really liked it. Uh, thanks awesome. a lot, man. Thank you. And, uh, I'm going to jump in, and I'll have a look at the questions as well now. And if anybody wants to ask me any more, I'm going to jump into the Auth0 booth, and we can carry on a conversation there if you want. Great. Thanks a lot, Ben. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao.